My name is Matthew Ellis, and I'm an archivist for the City of Grand Rapids Archives and Records Center. I am pleased to introduce our next speaker, Matthew Daly. Matthew is Associate Professor of History at Grand Valley State University in Allendale, Michigan, where he teaches Michigan, Great Lakes, urban, and public history. He works with a variety of community historical groups throughout West Michigan, has contributed to museum exhibits throughout the Great Lakes region, and serves on the boards of both the Grand Rapids Historical Society and the Grand Rapids Historical Commission. Matthew will present on the history of the Black Hills neighborhood and its ties to the furniture industry it is surrounded by. Uh, Matthew often brings his students down to the city archives uh, for class projects and tours, uh, and his passion and enthusiasm for history and teaching uh, shines through in every visit. Uh, please help me welcome Matthew Daly. All right, so you all, can, you all, all of you can hear me pretty good? Not too loud, not too quiet, all that good stuff? Good. I have always have a, one of my students have, uh, wrote an evaluation and said, Professor Daly is a machine gun for words, <laughs> which I thought was good, I think. Anyway. So, good afternoon, thank you for having me here. And I wanted to, uh, first before I start off, uh, offer my appreciation to uh, Matthew Ellis for his uh, generous introduction. And also to offer uh, thanks for, for, at his, for his work and Tony Wright at the City Archives. Uh, and in addition to Julie Taberer and her staff at the Grand Rapids History and Special Collections section of the public library on the fourth floor here, for without whom none of this would be possible uh, to be able to discuss this. So today, I wanted to, as, as was sort of pointed out, to, to talk about a, a particular neighborhood in Grand Rapids. And I wanted to start a little bit by saying, you know, you know, what my interest is. Yes, I'm an academic. Am I from Grand Rapids? No, I am not. So everything about Grand Rapids, I had to learn and sort of figure out uh, uh, to, uh, for myself and to think about these sorts of pieces. The thing I'm interested in is, uh, in essence, is the structure of how you build things. Did I live in Black Hills? No. Can I speak to firsthand uh, you know, life within the community? No, I really can't do that. I know some, I have some engagement, but in a present day sense, I really can't. What I am interested in, in, in sort of putting that in my sort of context, is to figure out why did this place get built? What were the decisions that went into that sort of operation? How does the physical environment get shaped? I work uh, heavily with a field called industrial archaeology, which in a nutshell is the built environment of work, where you work and all the things that are related to it. So that's sort of my interest and in what brought me into this sort of community. I spend a lot of time riding my bike. I'm notorious for what I like to refer to as the midnight bike ride. So if you ever see somebody weird riding along through a neighborhood, that's probably me, because I still do that, right? And it goes, it must be scary. I'm like, no, you meet really cool people. I'm not kidding. They really do tell you great stuff. And then you come back in the daytime, and they're just as cool. So to that end, that sort of shapes my interest in this sort of community and sort of gives you a framework for, for who I am. And that means that you spend a lot of time in the neighborhood. It also means that you sort of think about how you talk about this. Uh, I always, my, when I deal with students, students say, well, this neighborhood looks, looks like X and Y. And one of the challenges I have is to tell students, you know, guess what? Um, what does your neighborhood look like? And we look at these things and they go, oh, it looks like this and that. And I said, would you enjoy me coming there saying your neighborhood offer your, looks beautiful or cheap or rich or bad? And they go, well, that would be irritating. And I said, right. I always remember about when I work with these communities, I always think to them, there's somebody's home. And home is hard to nail down for perfection on that piece. But on Wednesday, October 19th, 1910, the Grand Rapids Press had an interesting article, and it caught my eye. And it described, in a whole section, an up-and-coming part of the city of Grand Rapids. And it said, there is a section of this city, the commercial importance of which needs to be especially emphasized. It is the section lying between what had been known as the Black Hills on the west and the Grand Rapids in Indiana and Michigan Central tracks on the east. It has been spoken of as the manufacturing district of Grand Rapids, as many of its largest manufacturing plants are now located there. This title, though, would do, would do injustice to the residence district located on the beautiful elevated plateau lying between the two valleys, and which is certainly one of the most beautiful and picturesque residential sections of the whole city. 
what they're discussing, and of course, one of the things that I always like to say is, is that Grand Rapids has a flag now. Uh, that's my flag that I really like right there, right? The furniture city. Uh, and is to really sort of, sort of have an indication to say that, um, if we can get this to work, there we go. Um, the sort of the addition to the city, right? So this section, where are we talking about today? is sort of a context, this beautiful picturesque section. So all this sort of colored, uh, colored in sections here uh, indicate the physical growth of the city. So when we think about the 1850 original boundary, and then you have 1857, uh, at this time, this is going to remain pretty much uh, the boundaries of the cities until you get 1891, 1924, a little bit, 1916, 25. So the city is sort of a large rectangle in that sort of regard. And what we're talking about is this little section over here down in the 18, sort of 57 edition. And what this is, is that this is going to be the Black Hills section. So down here is the Grand, up here is the Grand River. You have Godfrey Avenue and you have Granville Avenue, and you have US 131. And this little section in here, that sort of little streets, which you can see in this little sort of elevated area, uh, this is going to be the, what we're talking about today, the area called uh, uh, the, the, the Black Hills neighborhood. And it is, by and large, sort of an interesting location. Thinking about it is that to say, OK, how does it get named? If you have a theory about how it's named, you're probably right. Uh, there's about five I've heard different reasons. One of the most notable ones is that probably there are black oaks and different sorts of oaks growing along there. What this is, this section here, uh, this is looking to directly to the north. You'll see this a few times. Uh, what this area is, is it's an elevated plateau. It's tilted on about a 20 degree angle, uh, going from, from uh, its highest point on the west over to the east. Uh, you have a large trench. This would be the Grand. Ra this would be the Chicago and West Michigan Railroad. Uh, later on, it will be the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad cut. The viaduct cutting in. Market Avenue is going to be running along the, the sort of the northern edge. Uh, al along this sort of section here, the vertical drop is about 35 feet. I know because I fell down it one day. Um, yes, my 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 spouse's advice to me when I go places is don't get captured. So. <clears throat> I lay there that day and I thought, yeah, didn't follow that advice. Um, but in any event, yeah, so this elevated section, so essentially what it is, is it's above one of the mean high floodplains of the river. Uh, uh, Godfrey Avenue slices along uh, sort of the western edge, uh, and it is a rock outcropping, and it is physically separated by that railroad cut and by geography from its surrounding area. If you drive on Market Street and you drive by the water plant and you look, you see this sort of forested hill. Well, you're looking at the backside of the Black Hills neighborhood. It is an escarpment that sticks out. It is rocky in, in large part. It is a physically distinctive area. So there we go there. And if we look at this, it's going to be uh, what is also interesting about this area is I have an interest in what are called company towns. So master planned spaces for working class houses, usually owned by one company. And what was interesting was, because of this physical space, this would be a perfect place to have one. It is kind of a company town. What it is, is it's going to be an area, this is the railroad cut, the railroad track is now moved. You can see the bicycle path that comes in, we will talk about that later. In front of it will be chunks of Keeler brass, uh, what would be uh, earlier loose uh, furniture, stickly furniture, uh, Johnson and Michigan chair are going to be through here. Uh, and so you have the other areas through here that are going to be sort of platted out. So it's a series, it's a, it's a series of, of about, about eight blocks you know, square in that sort of, uh, sort of terrain. Uh, physically limited. There are two ways in and out. There is going to be Oxford, there's going to be Curve, actually really three, Curve, and then it's also going to be Dorchester to the south that will go alongside. So it's a fairly remote place. If you drive down Godfrey Avenue, most people don't even know it's back there. If you do, in the fall and winter, you can see some of the houses uh, to the west of the street. So that's the sort of physical parameters of what I'm talking about regarding this area. Uh, it is interesting in that it is a very separate space. It's very contained and very limited in that regard for that sort of piece. So why would you build this area, right? It, you've, uh, incidentally, you have to, to make the area ready to be, to be platted for houses. It is away from the main streetcar line, which will be Granville Avenue, and also home of the interurban, uh, which we'll talk about here in a bit. It is a particular location that if you want to go there, I like to think of it as a destination neighborhood. You have to really go and find it and take the time to look for it. It's tied to a transformation in the city's economy. So 
So in any event, one of the things is that uh, beginning in the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s, Grand Rapids will rise to prominence as Furniture City, USA. Now, when I, was, when I work with students, I, I talk about this and quack, 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 and it's so great. My students have taught me something brilliant, and I will share it with you. What they told me was, is, why would you care about furniture? And I said, well, you have to sit in it. And they're like, yeah, it's just something to sit in. I'm not really being funny. For my traditional age students, the importance and the sort of cultural connotation, the significance for large numbers of them, not everybody, the importance of the cultural idea of furniture, speaking to both an artistic piece, something to pass on, something to have, has by and large been disconnected. You buy some furniture, you sit in it. You don't really deal with that sort of component and that sort of significance. So it is uh, an interesting piece that that idea of furniture doesn't make a lot of sense. So you have to sort of come in a different direction. Grand Rapids is going to become the center of the household furniture industry. Uh, that's gonna be partly because the main uh, sort of wood and uh, sort of trading operation for wood uh, that is going to be cut moves from Albany, moves to Grand Rapids, into Michigan. You are going to uh, have the aggregate power of a number of powerful family firms uh, that are going to be drawing first along the west side, west and east side of the river, utilizing the power canals, which Gina just discussed, uh, uh, where 131 sits on top. In fact, you could push back the start of the freeway further with the filling in of the west side power canal that turned water wheels and ran the factories and the milling companies. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is down here in this corner, and it's too hard to see, uh, but this is going to be loose, Mich Michigan chair, stickly, ready and sweet, and then further on, all of the packing equipment. So if you ship furniture, you've got to build a box, you have to put it, and they didn't have plastic packing peanuts, you had shredded scrap wood, known as excelsior and so you would wrap it in all of that work this is going to be on godfrey avenue godfrey is an interesting place it is away from the central furniture sort of manufacturing zones it is going to be physically separated so you can't use the river for power these are going to be factories that are going to be stand alone they will need to require steam powered systems to run. Why does that matter? These are second generation factories. So they're going to be increasingly purpose built for furniture. They're going to have a certain uh, a structure to it. And they also, in these areas, uh, uh, along the east and west side of the river, you're simply being very built up at this point. Remember, in the late 19th century, this is a walking city. So the city uh, within these areas is very dense. Uh, there's not a lot of a flat, open area to build new factories, but you also don't want to be so physically removed from those locations that you can't sort of plug into the network of suppliers, right? We think of it just as a standalone facility. Well, you had to get your leather for the chairs uh, from over on Front Street, uh, down uh, where they still, uh, south of the uh, of AMP sort of warehouse, uh, the Grand Valley campus today. You would have to get your paint and varnish from the varnish works up on the north, northwest side. You would need to get some of your other materials from the brass works over on the east side. So if you're too far away and you're separated from the railroad tracks and those lines, it, you're unable to get those things. So you want to get cheap land, you want flat land, you want good land, but you can't be too far away and you can't pay too much money for it. There's another problem. Well, that's wonderful. You have this wonderful rise. You build the Furniture Manufacturers Association, what it will operate essentially as a cartel, uh, a cartel to control competition and to control pricing and the types of, of furniture. Um, and that's going to be a powerful idea uh, for that sort of logo. And you've got these new companies, and most of them are going to be relatively new. This is, this is not a, a sort of a, a, of a factory that's going to be near us, but it's, it's a great idea, right? Grand Rapids Chair Company, best slogan, we do not make chairs. <laughs> Names are deceiving, right? We think Altacore, like what does that mean? Well, guess what, didn't mean anything back then either. Uh, but what you're going to have is you're going to have the rise of the cartel and these organizations who are going to be put together to, to move those sorts of pieces around and to be able to do that. So these companies are going to have a great deal of power. So if you've now begun to build and you've decided for these furniture firms, you can't be on the west side plugged in. Uh, and by the way, all these companies are together by the power of what's called an agglomeration economy, which means that if you imagine the companies, if you can't rise in a family business to run the business, you go start your own business. 
the furniture industry has a relatively low cost to get into, especially as you begin to utilize more machinery. But that also means, though, that you're kind of, you can't be too far away. So one of the challenges they face is they say, great, we're going to build factories. And the next thing they go is, great, how does anyone actually get to this place? You know, there are no houses, there's no streets, there's no streetcars. How do we do it? The further you get away from this, too, housing costs will increase, which will mean that you are going to have a greater challenge to bring your workers there. So this is a map that, uh, that Matt Ellis found for me one afternoon. Matt, let me know, and I have to say, sorry to embarrass you. He, he said, I found a map I think you'll like. I like this casual way it's just sort of delivered to me. And I went, oh, is it a map? He goes, I think you'll like it. Of course I like it. What this map shows is it shows the Grand River. Uh, there is uh, going to be the Paramarquette Railroad. Uh, this is going to be the Chicago and West Michigan sort of loops in. It hasn't dug the cut yet. And this is the Black Hills. Uh, these are going to be the initial factories uh, located along Godfrey Avenue. What is Godfrey? Godfrey is, is essentially a crushed stone. This is looking north. Uh, there is no street. There are no curbs. They're like, yes, the street is wonderful, but getting, getting wood here uh, is a real problem because it just sinks into the road. It's a muck pit. But behind it, they identify these hills. They said, this is good. It's above the river's floodplain. It's thickly forested, but yeah, we got to get across the railroad tracks. We could do something with this. What I also love in here is I was, I was uh, talking to one of the neighbors and they said, yeah, part of our basements get kind of wet and swampy. And I looked at this map and in this little circle right here, it says swamp. <laughs> and I thought, ah, well, that tells me something. Now, doesn't it? When I showed them that, they went, well, that makes a lot of sense now, doesn't it? It's more than, it, what it is there is a natural spring still comes up because if you went there this afternoon, uh, the ground doesn't quite uh, ever freeze. It's a little bit uh, uh, marshy within here. So in a city of 60,000 people, you've got to be able to build this. But the companies kind of go, eh, we really don't want to do that sort of stuff. Come on. There we go. So for some time, what's interesting uh, is going to be that, there's a, that this area in the late 1890s really takes off. But what's really fun is, is you would see, gather the wildflowers. Take a Granville Avenue car and go to the Black Hills or a Trailer Street car, and you could pick the flowers. That was an advertisement in the uh, 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 1899 Grand Rapids Press, which I thought was fun. What are the Black Hills? Uh, just 10 years before, uh, as, as, the, as the newspaper and uh, the police reports discussed, this was an era where the city's villains would hide out in the Black Hills, swooping down to prey upon the unwary along the Chicago Road. And so this area is both sort of at the edge of town, it's not quite within 10 years, it's now become the place to go get wildflowers. Isn't that great? It's a cultural practice. You go out there to this remote location. At the same time, Granville Avenue, particularly with the situating of Sly Furniture, uh, uh, just south of Wealthy, uh, near today where the, the modern train station is, uh, what you will it'll do is it'll draw a huge number of Dutch uh, 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 immigrants there. It will, uh, Granville Avenue will serve essentially uh, for many years as the sort of the immigrant gateway into the city. Uh, what that does, though, is it, it draws uh, churches, it draws the interurban down Granville Avenue, and the associated streetcars. What does that matter? Uh, streetcars are local. They're going to be relatively small in Grand Rapids. They're usually going to have one set of wheels they drive along. They're fairly small, lightweight. Inner urban is going to have two sets of wheels or trucks. It's going to be much larger, the size of almost the size of a regular railroad car. Why would that matter if they were electric? If you've ever, if you've never ridden on a big, if you've ever wondered why you're on a big steam train, uh, it's lots of coal. You sit up front in first class because the smoke goes up and it hits third class in the back. That's why it's nicer. I, I always talk to that folks, they all go, didn't know that, there you go. But what the electric inner urban does is it also hauls freight. It also allows people an inexpensive ride, ride from the central city out to these areas. So this is gonna be a key component. Granville Avenue is going to be the commercial artery that is rapidly becoming the, a great business thoroughfare. And that develops very quickly. But the problem with Granville, if you've ever been out there, is it slopes pretty quickly, right? 
So if you go uh, immediately to the west, it plunges off, everything is terraced. You've got the low-lying area, which does flood from time to time. So therefore, it's great for factories, not so great for houses. To the east is going to be US 131. That was really nice to segue as well. But it, where 131 is and the railroad tracks, those were the, were the uh, essentially the car refurbishment facility for passenger cars for the New York Central. So there were huge numbers of structures. There will also be the site for the Grand Rapids and Indiana Railroad, which was controlled by the Pennsylvania Railroad. So you have this huge amount of industrial work on that side, uh, redoing steam engines. And if you haven't thought about it, uh, steam engines require, about after about 100 hours, they require their entire engines to be dug out and redone with, with skilled steam fitters and so forth. You need a lot of people. Directly to the west, you've now got these sorts of, of businesses. So this area is now becoming much more desirable. So instead of just being at the edge of town, sort of strange, now you've got a place that's really demanding it. So Granville Avenue gets built up very quickly uh, in that area. So hit it again. There we go. Um, and in addition, the factories begin to get much larger. So uh, along here, you'll have, uh, this will be the Chicago and West Michigan Railroad tracks. This is looking directly east. This is Godfrey Avenue. Uh, what you have is Michigan Chair. And in these facilities, they'll have lumber sheds and all these lines. These are going to be all the sidings for railroad cars, where you will have a dedicated set of, of, of uh, essentially Grand Rapids briefly had a small terminal railroad. What does that mean? Little, little steam engines running all over town with, switch, with, with uh, cuts of cars hauling wood uh, to the kiln areas to be dried, uh, to be sanded, to be uh, put into place. Redding and Sweet, uh, Stickley Brothers, uh, this is all going to be these areas. These facilities get bigger and bigger and bigger. How do you find these sorts of operations? This is going to be a Sanborn fire insurance map. And if you've never worked with those, they are a tremendous joy. They will tell you tons of materials. It's, uh, do they tell you a story? You have to interpret it, right? It's like the story that doesn't tell you the story. What does this mean? What these, this means is, is that Stickley Brothers, this is Albert Stickley, and his brother Lewis worked with him briefly. Stickley is one of the biggest names in American furniture of the early 20th century. Uh, when you think about Gustav, the most famous brother, Gustav uh, you know, wanted to be a mass marketer, but also wanted to have that sort of idea of shaping an idea of style and taste. Albert, on the other hand, had no such pretensions. What did he want to do? He wanted to sell furniture. If it was mission style, great. If it wasn't mission style, that was great too. He wanted to sell furniture. Uh, Michigan Chair really did do, uh, they were the chair people, right? They did a mid-price chair. And Ready and Sweet did a, a number of other sorts of pieces. They'll shift around. But all of these facilities are served by the railroad and are now employing hundreds of workers. And that's a real challenge, right? How do you get your workers to these places? This is another image of the sort of the facility. Stickly fancy chair. This is Godfrey. Um, uh, there's, there's Albert right there himself. Quaint furniture of character, Stickley Brothers. And then the interior. Uh, these are essentially today what you would think of as very, uh, I would have to say, if you uh, would think of them, they're, they're, they're quite limited in terms of equipment, of dust removal, a host of these sorts of things. Stickley uh, liked to say that his floors were two-hour burned through proof, which meant they were wood floors that had floors on both sides, so it would take two hours to burn through to collapse the building. I don't know who, who actually stood there to find that out, but they did. So Stickley Brothers is going to be, did I get it right? Well, we'll go from there. Uh, and so when we think about Stickley, all right, there's the sort of a sense here. This is Grandma Special Collections Department's image. Uh, this is the backside. So up here is going to be uh, uh, one of the schools built. This is Granville Avenue up along here. Uh, on the other side, this is going to be, give you a sense of it. So this is Stickley. Uh, right, you're going to have the back, the different structures. Here is going to be the dry, the kiln. You bring in the raw wood. You've got to plane it, sand it, get it ready. You've then got to put in a kiln. It has to have a certain percentage of moisture. This is a huge process that requires a great many people to be able to operate within here. Uh, you've got to be able to sort of, sort of get that sort of section. And it's a double-tracked railroad. Double-tracked railroads are expensive and also are quite difficult to get. You can also see the sidings to come in here. So this is the cut. So this would be, this image view of this would be in the Black Hills, standing on the slope, looking down, uh, probably around, around 1,000 feet from it. Uh, and these are some of the products that they're going to be making. Uh, and this is going to be an early sort of, sort of mission style. So they're quite, quite detailed in that sort of operation. So it's a very popular 
early 20th century style of furniture, and there's other companies that do that as well. But this is the sort of furniture, coupled with an idea of simplicity uh, for style, that's really gonna make Grand Rapids uh, sort of a household name, along with its uh, various trade expositions. This is taken from essentially the roof of, 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 the, of the Stickley uh, factory. This is looking towards what is today, uh, uh, it's gonna be uh, uh, Clemente Park or Rumsey Park. Uh, looking at, these are gonna be houses, so Rumsey be down here. This is gonna be Underwood, this is gonna be a series of, those, of, of streets. And so this is, this is, it's considered not Black Hills, but it can be, it's sort of mushy. Pleasant Valley, it's also called. Uh, and these are the sort of simple houses that are gonna be located within there. Uh, one of the challenges that the company has that Stickley notes to a couple of his, uh, of his uh, neighbors is that these houses were very inadequately constructed. They were limited, they were sort of thrown up, there were questions about the quality of it, and they were a little uncertain about whether or not this is gonna really work well, and it's just sort of a hodgepodge. They weren't so thrilled with that. So again, this map is a little bit blown out here, but again, so Stickley's gonna be right around in here, on, on, it's going to be on Godfrey, uh, and you've got, some of the, you've got this sort of area, and then there's uh, uh, Granville Avenue. So one of the challenges was, you've noticed Coit Park, which is interesting. Google calls it Coit Park. The city calls it Kensington, or Coit Kensington. Take your pick, three names, same place. Named for the Coit family. What this does is this is a, a large amount of land that's gonna be held uh, by the descendants of, of Daniel, or D.W. Coit, of Norwich, Connecticut. Coit never lived here, but he owned a lot of area. He was an early speculator in the region. His descendants, including Charles Coit, uh, looked at this and had an opportunity. What they decided was is they were gonna try to work with these uh, companies and they produced a new idea. So what, the, what Charles Coit, who's a local, uh, who's again a descendant, local developer, is he began to, to, to plat these areas. And in conjunction with Stickley, Redding and Sweet, Loose, and the other firm, firms in the area, all of them kicked in money to begin to build the first range of spec, what they would call speculative houses, to see if workers would want to live in that area. So it was sort of a, of a quasi sort of, a sort of planned community. What this does is what Coit Park Edition and, and, and these sorts of areas, there's Curve Street, this would be along the south side, this is Oxford, so one way to get in, the only way, really easy way to get in off of, uh, of uh, uh, Godfrey was gonna be Oxford, they lay out the streets and what they begin to do is to clear cut all of the wood. They talk about cutting it down, they lay out the streets, they plot all, the, all of the uh, lots and they prepare that area to be sold and to build houses. Uh, these are going to be funded, so it's sort of a, of a, of a what you could think of as a partnership between the factories and the landowner. The idea also was, was that one of the ideas for the Furniture Association was that workers should have their home. They should have a home. Why? Because workers who have to worry about mortgages are less likely to get, to get uh, involved in like unions and strikes. That was their idea. So beginning in, the, in around 1896, all the way into uh, the 1920s, a series of homes will be built. So this is Norwich, all the streets, Norwich, Dorchester, Oxford, almost all of them are going to be, uh, Woolsey, are gonna be named for streets in Norwich, Connecticut, from which the, the Coits came. So it has a distinctly sort of uh, a British, uh, sort of Connecticut feel. Uh, these are gonna be simple four square houses. Uh, several of them are, I, I, they discussed them as they did buy some kit houses to have them uh, built. The rest of them are going to be stick built homes. Their idea was that they would have a certain square footage, they would have a certain construction, and they would be able to have people uh, purchase those in what they felt was an acceptable fashion. These images are from the Grand Rapids City Archive. These are all taken in 1936-37. Uh, they're going to be from the property card collection. And so this is at a very difficult point in the neighborhood's history. So you can see they're not fancy, they're not huge, they are, uh, uh, rel uh, they're quite attractive. Uh, many of them have basements. That was sort of a selling point, was that the houses uh, uh, across Godfrey to the east that were on Underwood were oftentimes had Michigan or no basement due to the higher water cable and potential for flooding. So they were sort of promoted like live in the Black Hills. It's nicer, it's secluded, and as one uh, advertisement says, it is out of the smoke zone. 
meaning that directly to the west of this facility, if you've driven down 196, you can see the train yards. That is the old Paramarquette Railroad shops and yards, which is now CSX. If you have steam railroads, they're gonna pump out a lot of smoke. Because of its higher elevation, the smoke would go around largely following the river instead of blowing right into the neighborhood. So it was viewed as an attractive location. So here are some more of these houses. Some of them are gonna have the, the delightful hipped roofs. These are multifamily, two-story two houses. Many of them will be converted over to multifamily houses. These are gonna uh, date uh, late 1890s, early 1900s. In addition, again, Caulfield Avenue, uh, uh, just, uh, just along uh, 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 Granville, uh, in between the area. This is an area where you have a range of houses. So it's not just cheap, chintzy, working class houses. Their idea was we should have a better quality home. You get your mortgages through the Granville Avenue building and loan. And I was curious, a building and loan, you buy shares if you've seen It's a Wonderful Life, you know what a building and loan is. Uh, they would go through and I thought, well, who's on the board of, of directors? Why, Albert Stickley was on the board of directors, of course. Because if you're gonna have people buy a house, you might as well own the bank to give them the property, right? So you should be able to do this. Uh, my students sit there and go, we have to talk about money. Yes, you do. Money is good, right? So we figure it out. One of the eternal problems for the Black Hills neighborhood, which is located right over in here, the problem is, is that the area never has a church. It does not have a store. It does not have a streetcar. It will not get public transit. So if you ride the streetcar down, you've got to stop at Curve Street, walk down Curve Street through the switchback, walk across down Oxford Street, and that's where the stores, the shops are, are going to be on uh, Godfrey, and they're gonna be little lunch counters, some of the converted houses. Uh, the first time you get a bus is gonna be in 1924. They run a bus line uh, down uh, Godfrey uh, to that area. The irony is that for years, just over along the river on where it was first Waterloo, now it's Market, was the, was the streetcar company's principal powerhouse for that side of town, but they had no streetcar, which tells you something about what their thoughts were. 1924 was also sort of a big year as well. 1924 is the year they get there first. Uh, they get, uh, uh, you can see back here, this is an interesting one. There is the, there's the Black Hills. This is when it's still forested. This is gonna be right around 1895 or so. The, this plant is built in 1892. So this area is gonna be sort of, this is a underwood. This is gonna be right in front of it today. It's most, these houses are all gone today. It is now all parking lots. This is the Black Hills. Uh, you're going to see that, that uh, Stickley is sort of still there. It sort of dominates the skyline. And so along Oxford, you'll have another fun thing right here. Uh, Keeler Brass is to the north. Uh, uh, this is going to be Wilson Athletic Goods. Uh, so if you ever have any old Wilson wooden golf clubs, that's where they made them from. So it's gonna be built in again. And what they would do is they would take the scrap wood because we'd use hickory and oak and different types and you would simply redo that again. These are all that agglomeration economy. So you have a, a variety of ways to do this. So by the early 1920s in the Coit Estate, the residential, again from the city archive, uh, the Excelsior Rapid Company, uh, the, the Coit Park. Coit Park was originally created to be, for the neighborhood to have a park, that you didn't just do what most developers did. Lot line to lot line development to maximize profit. This development, they said, no, what we'll do is we'll have the park. The park is important at the end of Kensington Street and Curve in Dorchester. Kensington is here. The northern part of the neighborhood was viewed as too steep and not very attractive, so they left it alone in that regard. This is looking essentially southwest. Uh, uh, market is going to be right over here. You've got this, the railroad tracks. So not until 1916 did the city get around to building a viaduct. How did you get across the railroad tracks there and go up the hill? You had to stand there and, and uh, as the discussion was, run between the street, uh, the, the railroad tracks and railroad cars that they, they would park. And that was a frequent problem and it was also considered quite dangerous. Uh, this is a 1941 aerial survey map. This is Godfrey, there is Market. So this is gonna be loose furniture. Today there's other facilities located in. They're gonna be coming to the south. This is, to the, this is the back side of it. So if you notice these, I put this in here. This is Black Hills. Uh, this is heading today where the water plant is. They hadn't quite finished building the water plant. If you notice these little trails and the railroad tracks that come down, you can still find those. That was where uh, many of the workers either worked in the, in the furniture factories or they actually worked as, as skilled steam fitters and pipe workers that are gonna be in the Paramarquette Yards railroad uh, shops. So you would just simply walk to work. Again, this is going to be, uh, this is going to be, uh, this is Oxford. Here is the Black Hills. The northern part is not developed. This is the cut. 
There is the viaduct today. Today, the uh, bike path, Kent Trail's bike path, ends here. And you've got all of Granville Avenue and those sort of development and all of the heavy factories, including Keeler Brass. This is, the, this is Coit Park to the south. Uh, Hall Street will be just, just below here. And there is going to be the other new addition to the neighborhood in 1924, opened in 1925, Kensington School, an eight-room, $175,000 uh, built uh, school uh, facility for the neighborhood. And they argue that this is a great opportunity for the community. Uh, and this is more of sort of Black Hills. This is Curve Street, and you can see more of Johnson Furniture, American Excelsior, that this is a very dense area. And then, of course, this is the railroad shops and then the river. You can tell the, uh, the level of non-development. This over here is the Paramarquette Roundhouse. This is uh, one of the largest roundhouses in Michigan. And what is a roundhouse? It's the facility where you would take the steam engines and take them apart. Thousands of workers at its peak. Paramarquette Yards employed around eight to 10,000 men. So this is a large facility, and that's why it's going to be here. 1937 is a real crisis and really sort of alters what goes on in the neighborhood. Uh, these are going to be the color-coded homeowners loan corporation maps that are going to assess uh, how this sort of property's valuation in the wake of the 1933 financial crisis. 19, February 1933, the housing market essentially collapses with the bank panic. The great question that comes out of it is, who owns your house? And the answer is, we don't know, stay put. The neighborhood gets a, a, a degree of yellow, and it is uh, sort of not the bottom, which is red. Granville Avenue helpfully gets part as red as a hazardous investment grade. This is yellow, and, it, and the, the terms of the, of the site on the, on the, uh, on the uh, Homeowners Loan Corporation map says, neighborhood is a failure, brand new school closed. So essentially, the school is barely open for 15 years before it's shut uh, for lack of students. Uh, the neighborhood uh, really takes it on the chin. Uh, this is a fun map of the neighborhood. This is Kensington. Uh, you know, this is also the city archive. All of these have the names of, of the, the, the property owners in 1936. What's interesting is a couple of them are owned, actually, by the Homeowners Loan Corporation. This is a window into how badly the neighborhood's uh, sort of uh, property ownership, the value of the houses collapses. So if you gather this together, you can tell that this is a real disruption for the neighborhood. Kensington Elementary will, will remain closed until 1944. It will then open and close six more times until its final closure in 2004. Students now have to go up the hill to New Hall Street or Cesar Chavez Elementary uh, for schools. This building is now for sale. It can be yours, I think, for $285,000. Uh, if you've not been inside, it's actually a fabulous building. Uh, it's, a, it's quite a treat to be in. But this anchor to the neighborhood has now been lost. What goes into this is, uh, in addition, along Woolsey and Kensington on the north side, during World War II, uh, right after World War II, you'll build a series of temporary homes or Quonset huts that will be thrown up with the north end of the neighborhood because the housing market is now crunched so heavily for an absence of homes and affordable homes, which we never talk about today, of course. But absolutely, so this is a real challenge. How do we deal with this? And finally, at the, at the last iteration, Hillcrest homes in the late 1960s, early 1970s, what we built, they're built as cooperative homes. They are now sort of townhome, condominium, quasi sort of you know, affordable uh, structures at this point. But until recently, there still was no school. There was still, uh, there's no school. There was still no uh, sort of uh, uh, store or ability to utilize a great deal of that area for worship. There is uh, small pieces now. But the neighborhood is, is going to be essentially now sort of a little time capsule. To the south are largely 1890s homes, uh, early 20th century. The middle section is going to get 1950s homes. There'll be small little houses built. And then there's also been some habitat for humanity. Black Hills has also transformed demographically. Uh, it has shifted since the 1950s from being largely sort of white Europeans uh, of, of, of a background to increasingly African American to Latino uh, uh, communities. It has transformed quite significantly, and that diversity is a, sort of the next direction I want to work with. This is still a neighborhood that's had its ups and its downs. It has a lot of challenges, but it also is quite fascinating. This is a very physically intact neighborhood. When you ride into that neighborhood, you're going to see it. The homes along Underwood are still there, but so many of them have been demolished in the 1970s due to their poor condition uh, and having been rental homes and being right in the sort of the mixed in with the factories. So the neighborhood in some areas has changed dramatically and others it has not. And as the city continues to change, 
the great question is, is what will these communities look like in the years to come? One of the biggest changes is Kent Trails. The bike path rides in and comes right into uh, the neighborhood and ends right along that sort of section. So it's now part of that as well. But Black Hills, at the end of the day, is a tremendously uh, fascinating community. Uh, it is easy to see why people have such attachment and devotion to it, and that its identity is a, a, as a little island in the furniture city is a fascinating one that I look, uh, look forward to continuing working with students and community folks for years to come. So thank you. Do we have any questions? I think we have a few few minutes for. I did that good. There's one in the back. Yeah, Matt, the uh, loose furniture factory that you showed several times. Did that become McInerney, or did that was that building torn down and McInerney built? Because they look about the same finish. Yeah. Yeah, McInerney Spring and Wire is going to come in. Loose furniture goes under during the Great Depression. By the early 1930s, they fail. Uh, and that's a great question. Uh, the, one of the things that also hammers uh, 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 Black Hills' uh, housing and their ability for communities to have jobs is that much of the, of the furniture industry, the household furniture industry, departs around between 1930 and 1934. There's a wave of bankruptcies. Uh, they had also, they had already been facing uh, a lot of competition from lower wage uh, areas around High Point, North Carolina. The furniture industry moves first to North Carolina, then it moves further to, the, to South, and now it's moved overseas. Um, so that area had been uh, heavily impacted. Loose goes under, it's a beautiful building. McEnany Wire and Spring comes in and reutilizes it and it's still in use today. Many of those facilities are being sort of repurposed. Um, uh, in addition, Keeler Brass and so forth is there. By the way, Keeler Brass did not form to serve the, auto, to serve the uh, furniture industry. They were there initially to make lanterns and lights for the brass era automobiles, the early ones before the Model T. That's why they got their start and then they made, went into other areas. Oh, we have another question up front. On the map behind you, you were talking about the natural spring mm -hmm. that is up there. Would that be like around Eaton and Kensington? Yeah, it's or? going to be right in here. So it's going to be right in this sort of area, Eaton and Kensington, uh, a little bit over to Merrill. So there's some areas there. Some houses uh, have experienced that sort of piece. And there's a little bit of, if you go in the park too, there's a little bit of marshy areas in the trees. So they kind of filled it in or how did yeah, they, they okay. filled it in they brought in dirt one of the challenges they had to do and, and it added to the expenditure was the this is a, a, a sort of an escarpment but it wasn't flat so they had to tear the trees down level it grade it then it sank then they had to level and grade it and they said forget it we'll just build houses uh, and if you notice the street is severely subgrade uh, the street is subgrade they dug it and if you actually stand in people's yards and look you sort of feel everything tilting back because you're going up on an angle, and that's not an, an, an accident. Uh, in some areas, you'll notice it more, but the houses are actually terraced, and the street in some ways holds everything back. Hi, I have more of a comment. I owned a building on the corner of uh, Granville Avenue and Cordelia for a long time. It was a neighborhood bank. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it was a really nice building. It's no longer there. And my comment is about the demographic and how it changed. When I first bought the building, it was all Dutch. Yep. And I bought the uh, building from a, a, a family that owned the Dutch store adjacent to my property. Eventually, that was purchased by somebody from the Dominican Republic, and he eventually bought my property. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There's also a large uh, uh, Caribbean community uh, that are, oh, uh, yeah. folks are coming in. Uh, my colleague at Michigan State and former student, uh, Delia Fernandez, uh, has uh, her, her book is coming out about the Puerto Rican community that's gonna be located along. That's a, it's a real melting pot. Yeah, absolutely, and, that, and it is. It, it really transforms dramatically, and that's the, the sort of piece that I'm really interested in. And, and as I was talking to Delia the other day, I said, I need help because I clearly do not have the skill set for that. So, but I, I do the, the, the physical build stuff, and, and I'm working with folks to sort of build that out. Is there anything left of that railroad roundhouse? Uh, if you look at Google Earth today, and I've had the ability to walk out there, uh, the rail tra the tracks have been largely ripped up, but you walk out, you can still see the outline. The foundation is still there. 
They raised it because it was in, uh, one of the challenges for roundhouses is, is they're a working building, so therefore people don't really maintain them much. But if you go in there, you can see it. New York Central had an equally big one, and whenever you drive over the well, 131, oh, just up by Hall Street, you drive over it every time, but that one's foundation was ripped out. But yeah, you can still see from space the roundhouse uh, uh, where that was. I've heard discussions of uh, developers uh, working along Granville and fears of gentrification. Will that affect the Black Hills area, do you think, or have you heard anything about that? Uh, from the, from the, the folks I, I just speak with, at this point, they don't feel like it's there yet, but they have seen a diversification in people who are renting in the neighborhood and that rents have increased as rents and costs across the city have raised. Everyone's been hit with it. Will that happen? Um, I certainly know from someone in the real estate business who said, why is no one here? This is really nice. And I went, yep, it really is nice. And that's the base. Could it? Uh, it, it certainly could potentially. I, I, would, I would never say never, but right now it's not there. It's more the, the cost of everything going up. Uh, raising every, everything up and really making a challenge to that. Um, one of the pieces, too, is that when an area, say 30 years ago, uh, the housing market was so much lower and low cost, it made it very difficult to invest in renovation. Many of these homes, uh, people have, have done so, um, but it's certainly that cost factor comes in. Thank you very much, Matthew Daly. Thank you so much.